How you going? Set it down, Big House Sport. We are here for a season review. We are well and truly past the halfway point now. We are well and truly into the top eight. We've gotten past the teams that got knocked out first week, and now we're into the teams that got knocked out in the second week. You actually already know who's been knocked out the third week. I don't know yet. I'm not too sure. All I can tell you is the team we're doing today unfortunately, has been knocked out. Now, if you guys don't know this series, you haven't been watching it so far, we have already done the West Tigers, the Rabbitohs, the Eels, the Titans, Warriors, Broncos, Dragons, Dolphins, Raiders, Knights, Bulldogs, and also the Cowboys. So all those teams, the season review is up for you to watch after you watch this one here, which is the Manly Seagulls. Now, guys, also, if you don't know this series, we go through the positives, the negatives, a little bit of criticism, but also what we believe could go right for them next year. You know, did they do the right things going into 2024? What was the ups? What were the downs? You know, we try to give a rounded view about how each team's season has gone and what they did right and also what they did wrong. We'll go through the draws today. We'll go through the signings tracker from last year to this year and this year to next year. And we'll just kind of give a little bit of a thought process. You know, check a few things out here and there everywhere. You know, we, we, we do go in-depth into what our true thoughts are. Now, guys, obviously... Oh, this is actually incorrect as well. No, it isn't. No, it is right. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was on a different... Uh, I just looked at the 24 and said, no, it's 27 rounds. I forgot the three buys. But today, I, I, would, I would say with Manly, it's, it's more of a positive than a negative. Yes, there is going to be some negatives for sure. You know, they didn't have the perfect season by any means. That's why they finished in seventh position. You know, but they did obviously make it further than the two teams. Oh, well, not the two teams above them. One team above them in the Doggies. Uh, the Cowboys got knocked out in the same weekend as them. But, yeah, look, I think that Manly have had a pretty good year considering that... Look, I'm a pretty open disbeliever in Anthony Seabold. Uh, Anthony Seabold took over from Desi Hasler after that whole situation. The club was in shambles. The club was in a mess. Uh, I still think that there is definitely a bit of a mess to clean up. And going into the future, there definitely are some concerns here. However... I think this is a really, really good year to show that Manly have a quality team. Manly do have a team that can compete, and they do have the experience, and they also do have a lot of quality in the game. However, they are getting on the older side, which means that Manly do need to start considering their future going into 2025 and 2026 and beyond. So that's my quick little take from what I saw from Manly this year. Now, let's just quickly go into how they've gone over the last couple of years. So, obviously, they came in seventh this year, 33 points. They had that one draw with the Warriors that we'll get into. Let's go back to 2023, where Manly finished after 27 rounds down in 12th position with 29 points. So, they love a good draw, Manly, Manly, Manly. They do love a good draw because they had a draw with the Knights last year. Uh, so, they're the only team... Over the last two years, they've, they've had two draws, which is actually quite a crazy stat because usually... The, the, the last time my team in the Gold Coast Titans had a draw was back in 2016 against the Sharks. You know, I, I don't... You don't see many draws. So, for Manly to have two draws across two straight seasons... Let's just quickly see 2022 and see if there is a, a draw here for Manly. No, there wasn't. But, you know, it is just a crazy, crazy stat there to, to say that across two years, Manly have had that... Um, those two draws. But anyway, this is always so confusing with this thing. I just had a little bit of a mistake. Uh, so 29 points here, 11 wins and 12 losses with the one draw. Oh yeah, I don't know why this always messes everything up, but please forgive me. Anyway, point matter is they finished in 29. So if you switch this, if you switch this draw for a win, which you can do on the other side of the spectrum too and give them a loss if you'd really like to. But if you switch that, you give them the 12 wins there. Uh, then they would have been finishing on 30 points uh, with the Rabbitohs, the Eelson Cowboys, would have been above the Cowboys. You only give them by one point because it was a draw, so then they would still be below the Eels there. So realistically, they still would have finished just there in 11th, even without this draw here. Um, but the point of the matter is that this is a very mediocre season, especially for man Manly standards, right? Manly have won a premiership, I believe, in the last like four or five decades. At least one across the 2010s. 2000s, 90s, 80s, and 70s, and whatnot. They're very successful across a consistent period where they just always find a way to win something throughout every single decade. But then again, Bulldogs fans, you're very well aware now that uh, just because things happened in the past and in history does not mean that they will continue. But Manly have still shown, still have, what, uh, 2025 through to 2029, 2029, 2029, that you know, they could still keep that record up. Anyway, that was a really disappointing season for them in 2023. 2022, I believe, was the Desi Hasler 
uh, situation that they did have. They obviously finished in 11th this year with the 9 wins and 15 losses. They were actually red hot for a final spot playing up against the Roosters when that situation happened. So this is a bit of a wipe year for Manly. Like on Manly side of things, it's a wipe year. Not for everybody else, for them... It's a bit of a wipe year. So you don't really focus too heavily on that because that was just embroiled in controversy. And 2021 was the year that they went absolutely off. Tommy Trebojevic here, they came in whoop, they came in fourth position there uh, with the 16 wins, eight losses. But that was the Tommy Trebojevic year, yeah? So Manly started in 2021. We're not going to talk about the COVID year. Manly started in 2021 with a top four placing. They then go to 2022. They then go down to 11th position. That's the year of the controversy. 2023, they're still kind of getting over that controversy. There's a new team involved, and they're in 12th position. And then this year, when they can be a lot more solidified as a team, they go into 7th position. So, very up and down. No consistency there in, in there, but there is context that matters behind this up and down rising, right? There is context that matters there because they did go through a massive, massive legal situation. Now, Manly obviously finished in 7th place this year in 2024 which I think I predicted them for 8th position or ninth position. I didn't know whether they would go into the top 8 or finish down low because you'd seen in recent years that they were down low, but I did think they had the team to do it, and I didn't believe in Seabold, so I put him bank smack in the middle. I think it was ninth, and I just didn't, I didn't know, right? So I'm actually really happy with where I predicted Manly this year, whether that be 8th or ninth, because it is exactly the vicinity that we're talking here. And they did just have enough to get in. Now, to be fair to them, you give them this one win to go to 14, they actually would have finished on a home final here because their points differential are plus 113 to plus 96 there of the doggies. So that if you do... And like I said, you can give them the other side of things and you can put them down to uh, 11 losses. However, they still would have finished in 7th uh, position because the Knights were 3 points below them. It doesn't really matter. But if you give them a win, then you put them up there above, above the doggies there for a home final where they would have played it manly, manly, manly. And we all know that obviously the dogs uh, lost to manly at home regardless, right? In a fantastic game. Absolutely fantastic game. All right, so 13 wins, 10 losses. You take that, one draw. 634 points for. That is a pretty damn well good amount of points scored. To compare that with the Panthers, they scored 580. 580 is okay. Yeah, it's not great. You know, it's it's it's... Better than all these teams down here in the bottom eight, but who cares about the bottom eight, right? When you're a top two team and top eight team. But 580 was what the Panthers got. Manly got 634, right? So they beat out the Knights. They beat out the Bulldogs. They and, they and they beat out the Panthers. So when it comes to that top eight battle, Manly's attack was in sixth position. So nothing too crash red hot, but it definitely was the best part of their game. And it was better than what you saw in 2023 when they're getting 545 points. They're basically getting an extra 100 points uh, on the attack this year comparatively to last year. So it is an improvement, right? And like I said, there are teams... The Cowboys are close enough. So Cowboys had such good wraps for their attack this year. Manly only finished 23 points behind them in regards to their attack. And they only finished 19 points behind the Sharkies in regards to their attack. Obviously, very far behind the Roosters and a decent enough far behind the Melbourne Storm. Uh, but this is a positive for Manly because they have been heavily reliant upon Tom Tavoyevic. But I feel like this year, even when Tom's out, they do know how to score points. and They do know how to get, you know, wins when necessary. They do know how to, you know, really push past teams regardless, right? Which is evident in that um, the finals game here against the Doggies. But you go have a look at the defense. And the defense, again, is pretty bang average. It's pretty it's pretty bang average. Like, this this is average for the eight, and this is pretty bang average in regards to the defense there. 521 given up. So the Knights had a better defense than them. The Bulldogs had a way better defense than them. Same with the Sharks. Even the Roosters had a better defense than them. The Panthers and also the Storm. So they're pretty much around this, this six, seven area again. The only teams in the top eight that had a worse defense than them was the Cowboys, and that's it, actually. The Cowboys were the only team with the worst defense. So they're seventh here, and I think that was sixth or fifth or whatever, sixth in, the, in regards to the attack. So this makes a whole deal of sense in regards to exactly where they finished this year. To compare their defense with the bottom nine, they do beat all of them out. 
to go back and compare their attack, they do beat all of them out. So there are some teams here in the top eight. The reason why I bring this up is because there are some teams in the top eight that do still fall below a lot of these teams down here in regards to attacking metrics or in regards to defensive metrics. So it's good to see, for Manly's sake, on a balance level, on a solid balance level, that both of these beat out all of these teams down here in regards to every single one of them. So they do really appreciate that. And with that, plus 113 is their points differential. So they definitely beat out the Knights, the 96 Bulldogs, and the 89 Cowboys. They were pretty far behind the top four big dogs here. Uh, 186 for the Panthers was the only one close. But that is, again, an extremely balanced metric because they're down around... They're in fifth position. They're in fifth position. So defensively... They're in second last in the top eight. Defensively, they're in second last in the top eight. Attacking-wise, they were in sixth, right? So seventh, sixth, and then fifth. So this is exactly why they finished where they did. And it makes sense. It makes sense that Manly are just kind of a, a positive flatline team. So when we spoke about like the Raiders or the Dragons... Their flatline teams where they just stay... Sorry if you get upset here if you raise a Dragons fan, but they just stay mediocre. They just stay on the one line the entire season. There's not much up rising and there's not much downgrading. You know, they just stay in that kind of top eight competitive battle, but with a ceiling of eighth position. That's what the Raiders and the Dragons are. Whilst Manly are a bit of a flatline balanced team, but on a positive side where they do have a higher floor and also a higher ceiling, but not too much higher. Like we are talking in this five through five through seven range, five, six, seven. So Manly actually finished, and that would be based on this draw, but Manly actually finished on the lower end of this, this upscale flatline section. These two teams I wouldn't classify as flatliners. I would say this is an, an uprising of a flatline team here, a positive flatline team. So that's what I would look through here in regards to the Melly Seagulls ladder positioning. They did finish off the season quite well with three and two as their form, uh, and nine and three at home this year with four and seven losses. So you actually you look at their home form compared to their away form, and you can see a, a pretty clear difference here. They struggled significantly away from home, but when they were at home, they put teams to bed. They put teams to bed, man. 9-3 is really impressive. There is that, That's the same with the Panthers. It's one behind Melbourne, and it's one behind the Bulldogs. And one of those Bulldogs losses actually came from Manly, Manly, Manly. So they, that was one of those four, four wins there. So again, and you look at that, in regards to that, they are still you know in that relative area. So overall, Manly are a balanced team. You can see their defense is okay. There you can see their attack is pretty good. It's okay. And you can see their points differential is pretty good. Okay. Balanced team. Very okay. Do the job. Know how to win. Will get the job done. But also, can give up a few points here and there. But it's not going to be a great deal. You know, and I feel like this can come across as, like I'm saying, manly or average. Which, on the technical word, the technical basis of the word average, then I would say, yes, that's what I'm saying. But I am saying it in a positive light where I do think that manly are average at a good level. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from there. All right, let's move into the draw here to see what went wrong throughout their season and why they did kind of just really uh, flatline positively, yeah? So obviously the back end of the year, that's a very, very mixed bag. We'll get to that. So at the start of their year, obviously they start in Vegas, which is a, a distraction in my opinion. I do feel like it's a distraction. Every team will go through it over the next four years. Uh, this is the fifth year, obviously, but every team will go through it. I just think that the first game, the first season, was actually more of a negative than a positive. Yes, it brings more eyes to you, but also in regards to your preparations, in regards to your body clock, in regards to a lot of different factors, you've never played at Allegiant Stadium before, it's a difficult one to get your head around, especially as the very, very first team uh, to grace the field because they actually played before the Roosters and Broncos as well. So they didn't even get to look at anything, any metrics, nothing, right? So obviously they get the win though, which is a, a great little sign there. And then they play the Roosters, who were the other team who played the Broncos at Allegiant Stadium as well. So these two games are in their own little section. They're in their own little two se their, their section here because these 
all four, all three of these teams, sorry, all three of those teams were Vegas teams. This one, good result, high scoring game. That shows you they can attack, but also leak some points there. And they can still show you that they can attack here. 14 points is mid-ranger in regards to the defense. But I kind of wipe both round one and two off the marking system for what Manly and who Manly were this year. I, I do kind of do that. That's great that they got the two wins, though. Those two wins are very, very important. Because if they don't get those two wins in that really difficult area of the year, they go down to 29 points and they miss the eight. They miss the eight just off those two. So they're very separate, very separate, but also very necessary wins. Because otherwise, they go from 33 points to 29 points, and they go into eighth position because the Raiders then bump... No, sorry, ninth position because the Raiders then bump up into eighth position. So wipe them off, but incredibly important nonetheless. Then we get into the real season here. Now we get into the real year because they've now adjusted to being back at home in, in Manly. They're adjusted being back at home in Australia and they're ready to rock and roll throughout this next period. And then this is where, you know, things really start to show that balanced upside, right? That was the word I was looking for for the balanced upside. So they lose the Eels here at the time the Eels weren't expected to be as bad as they ended up coming this year. They lose 28 to 24. Hindsight, awful loss. Back then, it kind of made a little bit of sense considering the Eels were, besides last year, you know, in the grand final two years ago. You know, the Eels with Moses and Brown and, and, and the players that they have were expected to be a competitive team alongside Manly, right? So in hindsight, this isn't great. But back then, it was kind of okay. It also started off the season 2-0, and so it, it kind of made it all right. And then this game here to the Dragons. The Dragons were the most up-and-down team this year. You guys saw that season review. This is a very disappointing result here. But also, in hindsight, you can look back and say, oh, well, you know, the Dragons probably went and lost by 30 the next week, or they lost 30 the week beforehand. That's what the Dragons' season was like. So to start the season off 2-0, and and then to start to go 2-2 two and two is, is disappointing. Uh, but for me, I do look at this. You've get you've been given a four-point head start by your, your positive start there in, a, in two games that, you know, are really hard, in my personal opinion, to, to get a rhythm going in. So you've kind of started the season 0-2, when you've gotten back to Australia after that really hectic first two weeks. But then you've gone and beat the Panthers, right? So that's really inconsistent. That's in extremely inconsistent to lose to the Eels and the Dragons. The Dragons, by the way, at the time, were thought to be like a bottom four, potentially last place team. And then to go and beat the Panthers there at Four Pines Park. But that's also two away games there. And then you come back home there for a game against the Panthers and you win it. So it's showing you already that you are an incredibly strong team at home. Because guess what? This game was at home as well. It's already showing you through the first five rounds that you're going to play well at home, man. Te like, technically, you got the home advantage here, but we don't include that. Uh, so it's showing you that when you're at home, pretty much you can beat anybody. But when you're away, pretty much you can lose to anybody. And that's already what it's showing in the first five rounds. So I do think a key part of this season review is actually going to be focused around the fact that the home field advantage of Brookvale does really benefit the year. And just going away is why you've become such a mediocre, balanced team with the upside. Right? So that first five rounds, up and down, you take it. Doesn't matter, but you take it. And is integral to the season still. What the shit? But... Understandable at the time, coming back from that traveling. And then huge. Huge, huge, huge. Then we go into a next period here, which is a bit of a 50-50. This, this is a weird part of the year for Manly. So they go and draw to the Warriors 22-22. Both teams argue there was controversial calls. I'm okay with the score being 22-22. This game, the Titans, I'll tell you right now, that pass was about seven meters forward. With that being said, though, you know, Manly win the game 34 to 30. Got 30 points for the Titans, though, who at that point of the year still had not won a single game, right? So that's a really, really harsh one there for Manly to be giving up 30 points to the Titans in a part of the year where the Titans did not win until the week after this when they traveled over to New Zealand. So this... That was a bit of a weird one there for Manly. And then they go and get the revenge over the Eels. Guess what? They're at home. Guess what? They are at home there. 
and then go and lose to the Raiders here, which is a confusing one, 26 to 24. Raiders were a mediocre flatline team this year, which didn't have a great deal of upside, had plenty of floor, but finished on the upper end of where you would probably expect the Raiders to, to be finishing overall and did come home like a train really late on there. So this is a really disappointing one there. And then this one is also very yuck. You know, it's a little bit yuck. Because although the Dolphins... They start the season off strongly and then finish off the season really, really poorly due to my personal belief in their lack of depth and also the lack of being able to look back at previous years to get that motivation and discipline going. This is a really yuck area of the season for Manly, inclusive of that Warriors game. Because you take that away from home, you take that as well away from home despite the fact that the scoreline doesn't really give you a whole sense of belief. You love the revenge and then you lose to the Raiders and you lose to the Dolphins. So it's not 50-50. It's actually a disappointing uh, five-game stretch here. So what I've noticed from these first 10 rounds is Manly have been... I reckon Manly would have been like, what, 11th? I reckon Manly would have been about 11th or so. Round 11, they were 10th. They were 10th with five wins, five losses, and the draw. So incredibly balanced. That draw, you can look at and say it's a benefit because it means that you don't have to worry about your points differential outside of the, the Warriors. You don't have to worry about your points differential, which they were clearly above the entirety of the year. But you don't have to worry about that anymore. However, it also means that if you had won that game, you'd have already been above the Dragons, and you'd already be above the Knights there, uh, and then you'd be two points away from going above these guys, because your points differential is pretty good. 30 is pretty good at that point. 30 is, is pretty damn well solid. So again, you give them that draw, and it's massive benefit. If they lose... They're still exactly where they are. So the only reason draws are beneficial to your season is if you have an awful points differential, which for the Warriors, their draw, they had minus seven. So Manly's one was actually more of a curse in a way than the Warriors, who actually benefited from having uh, the, the draw. Right? So you could argue it's still a little bit of a loss there. Especially considering they finished three points above the next place team at the end of the year. You can argue that this is more of a loss for Manly. Well, so that's more of a win there for the Warriors. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anyway, 11 rounds in. I was right. They bang smack in the middle of the table. All right, so then we now move into round 11, where they obviously lose to the Broncos 13-12, to their magic round. That was a heartbreaking one there for Manly. It's a home game for Brisbane. But you guys are the ones that decide to do it every year. You've decided to take your game to Brisbane for the, the Mula Mula, which is like fine. But, uh, you know, it, uh, you shouldn't be surprised when the Broncos always win because, again, you're playing a home game as an, a, a, a home game as an away team against a team that really smashes at home when they're at Suncorp Stadium. They love a good Suncorp Stadium game, unless it's against the Titans. But the point of the matter is that you, you can't complain about this. Your organization has always chosen to take your game to Suncorp for the Moolah. Because you get the money. You get the money. I know that fans don't like it, but you get the money. So this is a harsh one to take, but in the same sense, it's your decision. And then you go and beat the Storm, which is a big rivalry game. You love that. Gave up 20, 20 points, but scored 26. That's one of the Storm across the entirety of the season. They didn't lose many games. Uh, they only lost five games throughout the entirety of the season. So I don't know if you play them again and beat them. Did you play them again? Were you two of their losses this year? No, you only played them once. Yeah, you only, you only played them the once. That's interesting that the NRL only put them into to the one game there. Interesting. Anyway, so you get a win. That's huge. Go into a buy. The buy comes at a really good time for you because you haven't had a buy so far this season. So you're one of the teams that benefit from later season buys, mid-season to late-season buys. That's huge. And you love that because that's your first buy. You've still got two to go. Then you go and play the Panthers away, which is a loss 32-22. Then you go and smack the Dragons at Four Pines Park. And we're going to stop at round 15 here. We're going to stop at round 15. So in that little period there, you lose the Bronx, you beat the Storm. You have the bye, you lose the Panthers, and then you beat the Dragons. Expected, but it's good to see that you bounce back from that early season loss to them. It's okay. You know, you competed. You only lost by 10. Still scored 22, but gave up 32. Love the bye. Massive result. And... You would have liked to take result, a result out of that considering the season the Broncos had. So after round 15, after round 15, round 15, 
You then move from, what, 11th, 12th or whatever it was into the top eight with seven wins and, and six losses. So now you really start to piece together the season. The plus 42 is still only seventh, right? So like you give them this win and you, you only would have gone up above these guys here in the Rays with the minus 55. Uh, would have solidified you above this team though that was chasing you hard at that point of the year though. So yeah, look, I think that that's a pretty decent enough stretch there for Manly. But now you can see what I mean about that, that upside flat line because you lose this game but you win that game against the Storm, who came first, the Panthers, who came second. But you've already beaten the Panthers once this season. And you've beaten the Storm there. So there's that upside. You know you can win any game. But the downside is that you can still lose games like this. But also, you look at this and go, oh, well, that's that decision. It's part of the process, man. You know, it's part of the process. So Manly are a little bit of an icky side in a lot of ways here. An icky side in regards to a lot of results. Now, I ignore this game because this was Origin. There's a lot of players out for the Manly Seagulls. Some for the Rabbitohs too, but I don't really give a shit. And I don't think Manly fans should give a shit about that result. Uh, the bye, obviously huge. Uh, big win here against the Cows. You'd love to see that. So this is where I think, yeah, you do start to pump them strong here. So big win against the Cows here, 21 to 20 especially up there in Townsville when you don't have a good away record. Then you go and pump the Knights 44-6, who obviously were another top eight team this year. Uh, much more of an icky team than what you guys were, though. Uh, and then you go and pump my Gold Coast Titans. And that was at a period, that was our best period. So we actually had won like three games in a row leading to this game. And then we got slapped up. I know the Titans led 8-0, but we got slapped up down there. Manly, Manly, Manly! We got slapped up. Oh, ho, ho. I got slapped, man. Don't worry. I got slapped. I got slapped. <laughs> I've just realized that I've done this entire review so far with uh, Queensland Country Bank Stadium as my background. <laughs> oh, that was the last review that I recorded, guys. Forgive me. Let me just switch this up. Let me just... Let me just... Let me just switch this up here. Let me... Let me just switch this up. I apologize, Manly fans. I know you're not at Queensland Country Bank Stadium. I apologize. There we go. Oh, yeah, it's fine. There. Yeah, okay. We're at the right stadium now. We're at the right stadium. All right. We're good. We're good. All right. Anyway, point of matter is, is we're going to slap it mainly. Uh, maybe that slap just woke me up. It woke me up. The Titans went and won two games after that, so it woke them up too a little bit. Kind of. <laughs> and then they go and lose to the Roosters 34 to 30 there. But And that game was a bit more of a blowout than the score suggests there until the last couple of intercepts. Then there was the bye. So we're going to look into that in, into the bye. Right? So good win. Great win. Great win. And not awful of a loss, but. Well enough of a loss, yeah. Which, obviously, this is the team that knocked you out in the end. And the buyer. So then, from round 15 to, was it round 22? Yeah. Until the buyer, you go from 8th, and then only up to the 7th position. Again, though, you've got 10 wins. The, the draw wouldn't really do a great deal, but you do have two buyers still to come. Uh, so, actually, you are arguably, with the two buyer... No, sorry, with one buyer still to come... Uh, you are on 29 points. So did the Bulldogs, though, to be fair as well. And so did the Cowboys. Don't worry about that. Ignore me. Ignore me. Point matter is, is that your points differential of 93 is fantastic. It's above both of these teams here. Upside, flatline. Upside, flatline. That's what I'm saying throughout this uh, entire uh, review so far. So this will be the back end of the season, this last five games. You go and whoop the Raiders there, but you should never be giving up 20, 24 points to the, to the Raiders. Uh, but 46 points away from home as well, Joe, is, is fantastic. You go and get the uh, win over the Warriors there, 13 plus expected. Uh, this is what the what the hell happened here. You know what? I remember this game. What the hell happened here is my question to you. Uh, honestly, you probably should have won that game, but the last couple of seconds, you just couldn't put the pass together. Then you go and beat the Dogs, and that's their first loss out of course stadium in the year, which is unreal. You know, that was a great win for you. Very good win for you. The Dogs were starting to fall off at that period in regards to their defense and whatnot, which shows. And then they got pumped the next week by the Cowboys. Then you go and lose to the Sharkies here, just the week before the finals, 40 to 20. So you go and have a look at this little period. Lovely win. The only reason lovely is because you still got 24. Great win. You definitely appreciate that. What in the shit happened there? Good win. Very gr good win. Very good win. Great win. And what in the shit happened there, but at least it's not the last place Tigers. It is the uh, top four Sharkies. So a confusing area of the season. A confusing area of the season where there is a lot of upside. There's a lot of upside, baby. What am I going to say? There's a lot of upside with 46, 24, 26, 34, 20 points. A lot of points being scored at this back end of the year. But you got 40, you got 22, 
You gave up 34 to the last place Tigers. This is a good defense. And the Raiders 24, who were in a part of the year where they needed to win, but still. The Raiders are a good, should be a good defense, not a great attack. So that's after round 27. You get into the two finals here. This is a fantastic win for Manly. That was a fantastic, fantastic win for Manly there. 24 to 22. Uh, they obviously felt that Koala was the one who, who broke them early, uh, late in the game. Uh, but the Bulldogs were kind of broken already. But it was because of you. You guys kind of broke the Bulldogs. Manly kind of broke the Bulldogs in round 26 there. And then go and win this game too. And, and Bulldogs fans can say, oh, we deserve to be the next week all that they like. But they didn't. They weren't. That's the point. So, you know, Manly go and win this game. You love it. There's the upside. And then there's the, there's the flat line. There's the downside, man. Plenty of upside, plenty of downside. Go on, get beaten 40 to 16. Now, I think you were broken in the first minute of this game. When Tolotau Quarter and uh, Jake Chibuyevich both get injured early, I know Jake comes back, but you know when they, when you lose two plays very early, your brain just goes into overdrive, and I, I feel like that's what happened. And Manly were flat after taking on a very good Doggies team and then took on a Roosters team that needed to bounce back from their previous whooping by the Panthers. So I can understand this. I actually tipped Manly. I was confident Manly would win this game, but I just don't think their their heads were in it after a tough game here, but also that first minute whacked them for six. That first minute just whacked them for six, and they didn't know what was going on. Hey, we planned this. Like, we can't do this anymore because he's injured. Oh, no, now he's injured. So now the second plan... To no, we can't do that. Uh, we're going to change this and bring this man on. And You're not thinking about the game. You're not thinking about what's happening in the now in regards to like getting your momentum and, and disciplining your team and getting your line right. No, you're thinking about shit. We've got players out. Shit. We're already down on numbers. Shit. I'm going to have to work harder. And then sometimes that can be a benefit in regards to working harder. But as you saw in this game, it just put more, too much pressure on Manly mentally and probably physically, but mentally. Because the Roosters had a lot of players out in this game. A lot of players out. And mainly Sammy Walker, right? Which is a key part of their attack. They still scored 40 points there. So, I think that for Manly to get to the second week finals after the last couple of years is a positive. I think it's a benefit. But obviously, going into next year, you do want to see them progressing further than that. However... I give them a little bit of a pass, but that's footy. You know, injuries are a part of footy. You should have done better. And they should have done better. Don't get me wrong, they should have. But you give them a pass. This was a great result. Ruth was just a bad team. The top four made the, the preliminary finals. What more can you say? So that's their season. Flatline upside. Had some points in them. Did have some points against them. And could get wins against big teams. And could lose against some really poor teams. Had a good period here. That's their best point of the year, realistically. Um, inclusive of the buy. You know, if you take out this one loss here, which didn't really mean Jack, they had a really good period from around uh, round 12 onwards to uh, that Titans game of round 20. It's a really good part of the middle of the year. And it set themselves up for a good strong back end. Uh, and then this is integral to their season. I separate it. It's a different part of the year. It's, it's a completely different section. But they got the two wins, which got them into the eight, ultimately. So, yeah. Uh, like, I'm, I, I'd be pretty, I'd be happier than you probably think with Manly season. But a lot to work on still, obviously. Now, let's move over here to the signings. You look here. Olukawatu, huge signings in 2031. Wow, you love that. You love that. Jason Sub 2029. Like, okay. You know, like, yes, obviously, is a solid player, but... Uh, I don't know if 2029 is worthwhile, but at least you've got a winger locked down for long term there. I don't think you need to sign wingers for that long, to be completely honest with you, but, you know, that's Manly's decision there. Uh, this is just massive, though, in regards to that Olukawatu signing. And Tanya Paseka had had a really good year. I liked what Paseka brought this year. I did. I liked it. Ooh, is that going to get rid of it? So, yeah, Paseka. So, the three long, long-term signings are Olukawatu, Saab, and Paseka. Uh, like this one. I'm like, cool, you know, like, it's not that I don't like it. And then Olakawatu is a fantastic one here. And then your mid-rangers, which is still long-term for the majority of other clubs, mind you. There's no player options or club options here. Oh, there's a player option for Tolotau Kuala in 2027. That's about it. That's literally it. So that's pretty good. You know, the only person who has the club, um, you know, has his own destiny in his hands is relatively Tolotau Kuala, yeah? 
Uh, and then you go and have a look at those mid ranges. Bench Boyovich 2027. 20, okay, you know, fine. Uh, I'd say Simkins and Trebojevic are part of that. Simkins and Trebojevic, uh, he's getting, he'll be getting older by then. That's a good time frame. Simkin, okay. Uh, Jackson Paulo, okay. Joe Welch, not too sure. Lachlan Croker, solid enough. Luke Brooks, I thought he had a great year. I thought he had a great year, Luke Brooks. Love to see it for him. Uh, Nathan Brown, he'll be getting on by then. Ruben Garrick, that's fine. That's good. Tom Dubovic, look at his injuries. Let's see. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a big call to make here. That's a big call in 2026, 2025 even, next year. You'll be thinking about this next year, mind you. These 2026s, you'll be thinking about next year. But it's a big call to make. Like, you want, you're going to keep him a one-man club. Don't get me wrong. He's not going to go anywhere else. But this next year or two will define, you know, the distance and the the mula mula, baby. You know, the mula mula. Because he obviously is quite injury prone. Touch what he doesn't. I don't want to see that. I want the best of the best to play the best of the best. You know? But I'm just saying. And then everyone else here, outside of that, Talau, you'll re-sign him. Sipley, 2025. Uh, Vega, Matthew Lodge, uh, Lawton, he's off. Uh, Aloye, I think he re-signed maybe. Uh, Jamie Humphreys, I think he might be gone too. I can't remember. Uh, Jake Arthur, Chen Kam Tong, Bullimore, Cherry Evans. This is the big one. All these guys as well, except for Ben Chibovich. You know, they're all... Every one of those 2025s and, and whatnot and 2026s are all like, eh, you know, like, it's given you good room to move. It's given you good space to disperse, keep, and move forward. You know, you've got the decision-making to... And your decision making through club options, no, no club option, no player options and whatnot, that you can do what you need to do. But this is the ultimate part of my worry for the the, the Manly Seagulls going forward because he is incredible, Cherry Evans, and he will re-sign. But they need to start thinking about what they do post Cherry Evans. You are at that point of his career now where yes, he is playing fantastic footy, and yes, every year he just gets better with age. He's wine, you know, beautiful Italiano, you know, he's fantastic, come on, us. But it will come to an end. Look at Sean Johnson. You know, look at these guys. They are fantastic until they're not. They're fantastic till they're not. It's very, very definitive when they're not. So you just need to start thinking about what you do post Cherry Evans and implementing that throughout. You've still got a good few years of Cherry Evans, but be careful about the, the length of contract here as well. Be careful about the length of contract post. Like, don't just go throw a six-year, five-year contract. You know what I'm saying? You would gave him a 10-year contract that he's done well. You needed probably more around him to win a comp outside of that 2011 season. But, you know, be careful about the post 2025 contract because you just don't know how long he will go. And I think Manly is smart enough to realize that. Don't worry. But I don't mind this Manly contract situation. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But like outside of all, outside of that, I'm pretty okay with the fact that they've got room to maneuver. Room to maneuver is exactly what I'm thinking about there with the Manly, Manly, Manly. Development list, Aaron Woods. Okay. Eight. <laughs> Uh, good luck developing him. Uh, Atharsi James. If, if that's the Aaron Woods I'm thinking about, uh, then good luck. You know, he might be about 70 years old by now. I think he retired as well. Atharsi James, Bailey Hodgson, Dean Madison, Leha Hobawade. I loved Hobawade this year. Dean Madison, not a fan. Bailey Hodgson, uh, you know, I haven't seen a great deal enough about it out of him. Atharsi James does have a big enough name, so we'll see, I guess, in 2025. And Aaron Woods, is what, how you going? This is okay. You know, it's, it's around that kind of no, it's from the development list I've seen so far, it's probably around that 10 through 7 range. You know, it's like, it's okay. You know, it's it's okay. It's fine. But I do like Lee Hapawada. I think he's been really good, and it's good to be seeing him get as much time as he has. All right. Now, let's look here at the games going this year. Luke Brooks from the Tigers, beautiful. Tommy Talao from the Tigers, absolutely beautiful. Jackson Paul from the Roosters, eh. Arthur AC James from the Tigers, haven't seen enough. Corey Waddle from the Dogs, haven't, no, not for me. Uh, Aaron Shubby Schubertmeister from the Titans. He hasn't gotten a game. And Jake Simpkin from the Tigers mid-season. Uh, huge. Absolutely huge. Everything else is a bit whatever. You know, everything else is a bit like, okay, cool. We brought him in. We got some extra depth there. Um, sure. You know, but these two worked out like a treat. It's good to see the Tigers. You know, it's coming from the Tigers there. 
Because it shows that they've got the talent at the Tigers. It's just that they don't probably get run correctly. But Luke Brooks, uh, obviously, had a huge year. I've been saying for years on the channel, if you watch my streams and, and content and whatnot, that Luke Brooks, once he left the Tigers, would explode. And he did. I don't know if about explode, but he had a really good year. Yeah, especially his standards, but he had a really, really good year there alongside Cherry Evans. And I think that he benefited mainly massively. I think if Luke Brooks isn't there and you put in an inexperienced six there, I think they probably do miss the eight. I will say that. I think they probably do miss the eight. I think he was a big part of it. And Tommy Talao had an incredible year. Honestly, one of the centers, slash wingers of the year. It was incredible, Tommy Talao. Really liked what he did at Manly. And uh, yeah, it was good to see him there in the centers. It, it, it was really good to see. So I'm happy with this for the most part. Got two integral players. And then everybody else was just depth. The losses, Samuel Fayunu, Tigers. Mine, a big loss. Kabatulangi, okay, to the Eels. Morgan Harper, didn't matter. K.O. Weeks to the Raiders. I don't think it's a big loss in massive context, you know. The, it's not like he wasn't really going to be able to be utilised um, and has done a great job at the Raiders, but you do look at him and go, wow, he's doing pretty well. Sean Kevin the Rabbitohs, not a big loss. Morgan Boyle, unsigned, not a big loss. Tui Palotta to the Dragons. Had a good year for the Dragons, but you're fine um, in that department. And then Zach Fulton to the Bradford Bulls. That's not a big loss. Um, mixed bag, you know, mixed bag. Decent, upside, mixed bag. Like, I, I probably wouldn't have wanted to lose some Wallafayanu, but it, it happened. But pretty much okay with the most part. The same thing goes with KO Weeks. You probably didn't want to lose him, but you, you understand why it happened. And I just don't think Tua Pilotto was doing enough there at Manly. So, like, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy with this. Uh, like, I'm okay with this. That upside work keeps coming back. It's got, it's got upside to these losses. But it's got that. So I would say that these are all fine, but integral. Fine, but specifically integral. All right. So 2025 games. Again, guys, this is NRL.com. So if there's updates and changes and whatnot, uh, then it's blame the NRL.com. They haven't put it up just yet. Uh, I can only go off what I see here. I'm not too sure Joe Walsh from Rabbit Union. Not too sure. I, I believe he was Reds, maybe. I can't remember. Anyway, the point matter was is that uh, I don't know enough about to have a really good conversation about. And the losses, Carl Lawton, Jamie Humphreys. This is all for whatever. You know, like Carl Lawton, solid enough. Jamie Humphreys, young bloke. This is all... I can't conversate heavily enough about it. I don't have enough knowledge about this to really speak. I can talk to you about Carl Lawton and I do know Jamie Humphreys, but I just don't know Joey Walsh. So... It's good to see Manly are, a lot, uh, are being consistent with who they want. It's, it's good to see that Manly, you know, aren't stressing because they've still got plenty of time. With, uh, next year is the big year for Manly to see what direction they go. This year is a, a bit of a changing of the guard year in a lot of ways to next year. And then next year is when they decide we're going this direction, we're going this direction. And that goes in regards to Cheza, and that goes in regards to a lot of their key players as well. All right, so yes, it's an interesting path that Manly can take. There is a lot of decisions they can do, but it just has to be the right one. It just has to be the right one, man, which is easy to say, but yeah, this is okay. You know, I just don't know enough about it. But overall, man, you look at Manly and you say, I don't know how much they can improve into next year. From their seventh spot, I don't know. I don't see them as a top four team. I def definitely don't see them from twelve below, eleven below. They, they they realistically should just stick in this area, in my personal opinion. And I know many fans will hate to say that, but to see that, but I just think that there is just still so many negatives in regards to the defense and 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 a lot of positives in regards to the attack, and is very equal out and a very balanced there. Although there is uh, upside to their defense, the fact is is that they still are on the lower end of the top eight there. Um, and that's why I don't think they can be awful, awful, awful because there are plenty of teams that are worse than them. However, you know, I just don't know if Manly have that next oomph and that next step. And I can be proven wrong because Manly always do find that next step and that next oomph. You know, they, they love a good oomph. They love a good oomph, the Manly Manly. But I think next year is actually a, more of a year to tell you what do we do next. I think this year's fine to, to come seventh. I think next year they'll finish in a similar area. But next year is going to say to you, we have a team to go on and win the comp with, so let's go this path. Or our players are starting to get older now. We're probably not going to win a comp with all these guys. So let's tinker and rebuild. Not full-blown rebuild. You don't need that. But like tinker and rebuild 
a different path. That's the two directions. I think that they are at a crossroads right now with 2025. But 2025 is a good year for you to see which path you do go down. Anthony Seabold, interesting character. Do you believe in him as a coach? Got you back at the top eight. Is that more of the team left over from Desi's time? Or is that Seabold, you know, really coming through? I don't know. I personally believe that it's still reliant so heavily on Cheza and Tom Dubovic. I don't know if, if Seabold has implemented himself enough into this team. I do think that there is a like the balance. I don't know necessarily know if the positives are coming from a Seabold or from the experience that many have had throughout, you know, their, their previous ten years as a you know, more so as a collective with like Cherry Evans and the Dubovic's and all that sort of stuff. The point is, is that I don't know how much Seabold is actually influencing and impacting this team besides being the face of the, the coaching system. Do you know what I'm saying? So there are some definite positives. I just don't see the upside of being a top three team despite the fact that... Oh, I didn't mean to click the Panthers there. Uh, despite being able to beat these three teams, they can. Maybe not the Roosters, but they can. But like to be able to beat these two teams is great, but they just don't have that... that they don't have... I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, man. There's just something missing. There's just something missing, man. There just is. It's it's irking me about Manly because I just don't see them up here, but yet they can beat these two teams. And... Oh, not the Sharkies. Sharkies are getting good results against them. They can beat these two teams, but then they go and lose to the Tigers down in the... Um, in last place. Ignore that loss, but they did lose them. They nearly lost to them, and they did lose to them at one stage. So you could argue that they lost to the three of the bottom four with a very close win against the, the, the fourth place team, fourth last team. So yeah, I don't know. Manly are a very intriguing team on so many levels. They're irky. They've got talent. They've got experience. I just don't know which path they take in that crossroad. But there we go, guys. I appreciate you for listening in. A bit of a longer one, this one, to be completely honest with you. Uh, obviously, guys, hit that like button. Subscribe if you're new around here. If you agree, disagree, slightly agree, slightly disagree, please jump into the comment section and let me know exactly what your thoughts are. It's my opinion. You know, at the end of the day, I'm just reading through it and giving you what I'm seeing and what I'm looking at. Uh, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then feel free to jump into the conversation below. I welcome it. I open it. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you your thoughts are. Uh, but I appreciate you guys as per usual. Uh, we're still, for me, I'm still waiting to see who gets knocked out of the preliminary finals this weekend. I know that was last weekend for you. Uh, but looking forward to pumping through the series and uh, the NRL season coming to a cheeky little close. But anyway, guys, like I said, thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Catch you later. See you.